All right, I think I'm going to get us going here. Um, good evening, friends, readers, and book lovers. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Bosher, and I'm from Schuler Books. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight virtually for an evening with Susie Sheehy. Schuler Books is an independent bookstore with three locations in Michigan, and we are proudly celebrating 40 years of book selling this year. You can follow along with all the bookstore happenings on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Dr. Susie Sheehy is a physicist, science communicator, and academic who divides her time between research groups at the University of Oxford and University of Melbourne. She is currently focused on developing new particle accelerators for applications in medicine. The Matter of Everything is her first book. In The Matter of Everything, Dr. Sheehy introduces us to the people who, through a combination of genius, persistence, and luck, staged the experiments that changed the course of history. From the serendipitous discovery of x-rays in a German laboratory to the scientists trying to prove Einstein wrong and inadvertently proving him right, to the race to split open the atom, these exper experiments not only shaped our understanding of the cosmos, but also shaped how we live within it. These breakthroughs have helped us build detectors that map the insides of volcanoes, develop life-saving medical equipment, and create electronic devices used in everything from fiber optic cables to solar panels, among countless other advancements. Along the way, Sheehy pulls back the curtain to reveal how physics is really done, not only by theorists and blackboards, but by experimentalists with brilliant designs. Celebrating human ingenuity, creativity, and above all, curiosity, the matter of everything is an inspiring story of discovery and a powerful reminder that progress is a function of our desire to know. If you still need a copy of the book and wish to support this independent bookstore, please reference the link that I will drop in the chat here shortly to direct you to our website, schulerbooks.com. If you are a Michigan local, we encourage you to check out our brick and mortar locations in Grand Rapids, Okemos, and Ann Arbor. We are about to begin. Keep in mind that throughout the event, if you have a question come up, ask away in the Q&A bubble below and we will get to them at the end. This goes without saying, but please remember to be respectful and mindful with your questions. Now, without further ado, welcome Susie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here. Um, I want to just get rolling uh, or get started by having you describe this book and your project. Um, I read the official one, um, but yeah. <laughs> I would love to have the author talk about their work. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm an experimental physicist and I work on particle accelerators, as you mentioned in the sort of bio up front. And so I've spent about 20 years getting, you know, getting to learn and understand and make discoveries and, and trying to push forward the area of um, particle accelerators, which are used for particle physics, among other things, including cancer treatment that you mentioned. And along the way, I sort of became a bit diverged from um, my initial inspiration in physics, which was actually um, when I went out in, and observed the night sky for the first time and sort of got blown away by all these big ideas and concepts and theories in physics. and uh, I found that my day-to-day -day job as an experimental physicist looked very different from, um, from what people think of as what a physicist does, which is often, yeah, sitting at a desk, you know, or at a blackboard, pen and paper, you know, calculations. And I was just like, well, no, physics is done in the real world. Like, you know, actually learning how to physically design and make or craft an experiment to actually test how our world works. That's what differentiates physics from, say, mathematics, which is where, you know, like you can create a theorem which is self-consistent. And like, but physics is about the real world. And so I felt like, first of all, what was missing in this space of um, of of physics books was this this experience of what it's actually like to go into the lab and interact with particles that we can't see with our own eyes, et cetera. And, and that's what I did for a job. And I also knew that through that story that many, many different real world applications and, and things had come out of it. So everything from the chips inside your smartphone to some of the things that you listed to yeah, X-ray devices, CT scanners, that kind of thing had sort of come about as part of this serendipitous journey through our curiosity driven research into the fundamental nature of the universe. Now, I knew these stories because I worked in the field, but I found that when I spoke to sort of people who, who worked in other fields, they had no idea that 
this sort of fundamental research could lead to world changing and has led to world changing inventions. And so I, I kind of wanted, I started out going, I want to tell that story. And, and then the research process really led me into finding what I thought were sort of 12 key experiments in the history of particle physics. And then as I wrote it and as I researched it, it really became a human story and a narrative driven story of what we as people do and why we do it to sort of, why do we put ourselves through this, right? And how do we do that to actually um, slowly piece by piece make the discoveries which help us understand how our universe works on a fundamental level um, because it's a really hard thing to do and and you know through that whole story then through 120 years of this discovery and invention and amazing uh you know some of the biggest experiments on earth now are in this field um and when I looked back and read the stories and found the stories of the people who've done this throughout the last 120 years it was this incredible sense of belonging um which I actually hadn't really had before in my career where I was like oh it's always been hard to do this it's always been you know there's always been this incredible human element of what it is to do physics and to go in there every day and to try and uncover something about the world that nobody has ever known before Um, and that's the sort of sense I want people to get when they read the book is not only is it exciting but it can also be frustrating and it can also be unexpected and serendipitous Um, and yeah at the end of the day I sort of walked away from it with this new invigoration about my own research and about my own teams and the people that I work with. Um, So that's kind of my, yeah, both the book journey and my journey, uh, which are very much intertwined. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, What prompted you to say, like, I want, I want this book out in the world? I know you talked about that a little bit, but like, not everyone makes it to being an author. (laughs) Um, so like, how did you go from like, I have these ideas, I love physics, um, I've been working in this field, um, but actually like putting it on paper and getting it out into the world? Yeah, so for, for many years, I'd alongside my research, I'd also been doing public speaking and a little bit of, you know, bit of expert TV presenting, things like that. So I love telling stories about science and about physics in particular. Um, and then again sort of serendipitously like some of my talks were watched by a number of literary agents and this has never happened to me before or after but in one week I had approaches from three different literary agents and it's like the first time you get one you go oh just ignore that it's just someone I don't know I don't know what they want um and then the second one's like that's weird I just had one like is my name on some list uh and then when the third one rolls in it's like what's happening I'm gonna have to actually (laughs) talk to one of these people so um So I I ended up meeting uh, only one of the three, actually, because he was based in London and he was the one who sat me down and was like, with a book, you can take these stories that you're loving telling and, and, you know, all these ideas and you can, um, you know, build it into something that's that's much better, you know, that's like deeply researched and like a really solid story that that then, you know, you can build on. But it also gives you this like physical thing, which is always very exciting to like physically hold a book that you've written in your hands. Um, and and it allows it allows you to tell a bigger story than you can in like a one hour lecture or um, or a public demonstration talk um, and and a story that's driven by yeah, exactly what I want to tell in the world as well. So he kind of convinced me. It wasn't like I had this underlying oh, I've always thought I'd write a book, which some people think. Um, I've always loved books. I've always loved writing. But uh, the idea of this book was very much, um, think, I mean, I mean, how lucky am I, right? Like it kind of came to me, the 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 idea uh, or the um, the opportunity. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you were, you were doing the work in a different medium. And yeah, someone, these people saw potential in you to put it on paper and Right. And Chris, my agent, Chris Well Beloved, Aiken Alexander in London, is an absolute sweetheart. And uh he has been the best support. And um yeah, I mean his his support and this book has been a life-changing journey. Like I, I'm now like, oh, now I'm a writer. And that was not an easy process to go through. Um, but I've I've loved every minute of it. The research, the writing, yeah, everything. That's awesome. Um, all right, we were uh or I've been noticing as I've been going through this book that there are some themes that come up and you and I kind of really briefly talked about how there's a theme of women in science. Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Tell us a little bit 
about that and this book? Yeah, so um, I think most people in, in the audience will be aware that there's fewer women in science than there are men in science. Um, and that historically, this has been even worse than it is now. Um, obviously, as a woman in physics myself, I've obviously observed this and I've had, you know, the, the trials and barriers that come along with that, which are far fewer now than they were in the past. When I was taught physics and was taught the sort of pigeon version of the history of physics and even the experiments that I, I've written about, you know, they tend to be led, the story tends to be led by like usually a single person, usually white man, right? So even the stories that I've written about, I, I, you know, the lead researchers were people like William Röntgen, um, Ernest Rutherford, J.J. Thompson, you know, these, these heroic figures almost of science. Mm -hmm. And yet in my day-to-day -day experience, I know that it's important in, in science, even in a small lab, which is what mine is, that the team aspect is very important and that there's always people coming and going and contributing in different ways. And so I think what surprised me when I was doing my research in this book um, is that these stories of women who were there and doing the work, even in the early 1900s, sort of jumped out at me. They like jumped out of the out of the page. And I remember this one um, photograph, which which really, there was this group of people in Montreal in 19. No, the photo was 1899 and it was Ernest Rutherford's first research group and Rutherford features a number of times in the book for um, his gold foil experiment and then later the first particle accelerator that splits the atom. He sort of really is like this father figure of nuclear physics in particular. But his first graduate student was a woman named Harriet Brooks and I'd never heard of her before but people especially in Canada um, will have heard of her because his research group was in Montreal and there's this beautiful photograph of them. They're all rugged up in their winter things, you know, with big hats on and huge coats on. And there's this stunning woman, like just staring at the camera straight in the middle of this group of about 10 men. And you just, you can't miss her. And yet every story I've, I've read and heard about Rutherford's early days of research, uh, miss her out. Like I'd, I'd never heard her name before. And I was like, who is this woman? And I, as an, as a fellow woman in physics, I couldn't, avoid going down that rabbit hole and learning about her story and the story of other female physicists that jumped out and that was one of the aspects that led to um my sort of greater sense of belonging because I was like oh there's always been women in this field and they faced much greater barriers than than we do now although they're sort of subtly different but um very quickly Harriet Brooks's story is she contributed um experimental work during her master's and a bit later on um, she did a PhD as well and, and further research to some of the early experiments in radioactivity that helped us understand um, the half-life concept. So this concept that a, a, a lump of material uh, over some time, half of it will decay away into a different type of atom. And this idea of atoms sort of transmuting from one to the other, which was thought to be sort of alchemy before that time, you know, it was, wasn't thought to really be, be real. Um, and some of her early experiments involving things like radium and thorium underpinned the uh, conclusion that that was actually happening, which happened a little bit later. Um, so her work was incredibly important to our understanding of radioactivity. And she, she goes off, uh, she, she um, receives a, uh, she's in a relationship at the time when she's doing her research and she receives a marriage proposal and uh, she's about to take it when she discovers that if she, if she gets married, she'll have to quit her job. She'll have to quit her research. Um, and she not only like riles against the system, right. And writes this like really strongly worded letter about how women shouldn't have to, you know, quit their jobs. Uh, this is like, early 1900s it's incredible that she was like this feminist in like early 1900s mm -hmm. um, but she also calls off the engagement like she decides not to get married uh and then so she goes on with her research and then eventually she goes to the UK for a while she works with um, Marie Curie as well um, and travels around a bit and then she gets to about the age of 30 31 and this is really now like a crunch time in in her life and she um so she's then having to decide between working with Rutherford again in Manchester because he's moved over there and he's trying to hire her and he's writing like in her reference letter for a fellowship there, he's writing, you know, she's the most preeminent woman in physics uh, other than Marie Curie, basically, um, in, in radioactive radioactivity. Uh, so she's really, you know, she's really a front runner. Um, and she receives another marriage proposal now this time from someone who was like courting her from Canada to the UK one of her former tutors 
And of course, you know, the early 1900s, you're 30, right? You're 30, you haven't had children yet, you're not married and you're a woman. And so she, um, at that point, the societal pressure was really too much. And she, so she actually accepts the proposal. She moves back to Canada. She has three children. And unfortunately, at that point, her sort of bi biography, and there was a small book about, about her, um, but her biographical details kind of end there. And there's no interviews with her. And there's no, um, you know, sort of oral history project that covers like, how she felt about that or how you know so she never did she never appeared to work in physics again whether unofficially or officially and personally I would love to know how she made that decision and yeah. why she made that decision and um whether she regretted it or whether she was just happy having contributed what she had contributed to physics and that that was enough for her I'd I'd, I'd love to know yeah that would be fascinating to know her whole story sounds just incredible um, and I'm sure you found more examples like that. Um, and if you want to go read the book, I'm sure you can learn about it. Yeah, there's heaps, there's heaps. I even found um, one researcher in um, India called Biba Chowdhury, who was just an incredible uh, yeah. researcher. And these are women who were publishing like first authored nature papers with discoveries, right? Yeah. And then, you know, not to give away the, the trick, but like the discoveries get attributed to other people who win the Nobel Prize. Um, I think he could have predicted that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe it's um, the woman you just talked about, but did you have a favorite historical figure to like go down into their rabbit hole? Like this is your person that you were just so stoked to like go deep on. I think one of the people that really intrigued me when I learned more about him was J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron. Obviously, the like the stories of the women were amazing, but the depth of the stories like they're just not recorded the information isn't there so if anyone out there has more information than um or any you know diaries or like the diaries weren't kept they weren't interviewed but like jj thompson was like a really famous physicist even in his time he led the the um physics lab in in cambridge the cavendish lab um discovered the electron in 1897 which is sort of in chapter one it was like the first subatomic particle that was discovered but in his memoir which is called recollections and reflections i have a copy somewhere on somewhere on my bookshelf here <laughs> um he, there's like a whole chapter about seances so he turns out to be like this yeah this fascinating character in a slightly unexpected way um that he I mean he took very seriously obviously his his science um but I learned things about him that humanized him in a way that I'd never felt before I just saw him as this like powerhouse of research and even his contemporaries thought about him in quite like that he was quite a sort of scarily intellectual guy yeah. and then I find out that his like well the quote is that he was um, practically useless with his hands so he like he had to have assistants make all the equipment and run all the equipment for him for his experiments because he would just break it because it was you know it was made of glass and it was very fragile and and so to actually do his experiments, um, his assistant Ebenezer Everett basically made everything and spent a lot of time helping um, Thompson and yet isn't usually credited in, in the story. Um, and then the seances thing is just, just wild, but it was really, you know, it was Victorian England and uh, seances were all the rage and he managed to set up um, and, and this isn't in the book, this is just in my, my extra research, but he, <laughs> he managed to set up a... Um, a seance event where he attended with a number of other scientists and they like were allowed in to check pre-seance that there were no you know like wires and strings and things like that and they tried to like scientifically approach whether or not the physical manifestations that happened or the physical um telekinesis and things like that they tried to sort of create a scientific method to test it based on like one uh I guess psychic who was um open to to that idea and like they got quite into it and and the conclusion was well there wasn't one really it was sort of inconclusive um they they never they never definitively sort of said oh no we've figured out how they do it there's like strings behind the curtains that wasn't the case right yeah. um but then they were also unable to replicate things often and you know like it was they yeah. were they they still remain very skeptical at the end of it but I thought that isn't that interesting because today like a professional physicist nowadays investigating telekinesis would be fired yeah. probably right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and, and you know I you know I'm I'm skeptical on it as well right but I think it's interesting how um the fundamental questions 
uh, or what, what is correct as a fundamental question or what is allowed as a fundamental question about the universe does follow societal trends and cultural factors as well. So like now, if I decided to investigate telekinesis, I'd probably be fired because uh, people are like, well, that's absolute rubbish. But back then, um, societally, that was, it, you know, electricity and radioactivity were seen as just as mysterious as telekinesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thinking about that, like, do you think there are things that we are currently studying or um, maybe you should be studying that <laughs> seem as mysterious as like electricity seemed? Oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. I mean, question. I mean, we are researching, we are, re you know, yeah. people are researching just about everything you can think of. Right. Um, and I, but I, I probably, I probably would be badly advised to suggest topics that we should be researching oh, yeah. <laughs> slightly off on the, you know, the sort of yeah. angle. Um, but I think where what's interesting to me at the moment in science is like we are so diverged into these different silos of physical disciplines or of scientific disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, the massive divide between the humanities and the sciences um, and between, you know, people's lived experiences and the sciences sometimes leads to these investigations where you get scientists sort of doing big studies and when it's announced or the press release goes out and everyone's just like well well duh we knew that already <laughs> which is like a bit of a mismatch between like people's lived experience and then um actually you know yeah. what it takes to actually demonstrate that something really works that way um and that we're not kidding ourselves or biased um but I think where the, a lot of the interesting questions are at the moment is really on those disciplinary boundaries and that the one of the big skills now, and this sort of comes through in the book as well, as physicists had to learn to collaborate with other other fields, you know, biology, engineering, you know, all these other disciplines in order to make progress. As a scientist now, you have to have this extra skill set of being able to actively collaborate across disciplinary boundaries. And it's still rare, um, this ability to sort of go, okay, well, I might be an expert in in my thing. But, you know, this biologist or this psychologist or this uh, engineer is, is the expert in their thing. And there's um, there's a sort of curve that people talk about of becoming a what's called a T-shaped scientist, right? So a normal scientist is an I-shaped scientist. So you have this like deep expertise and a T-shaped scientist is like you have your deep expertise, but then you have this like broad, um, broad expertise as well or broad interest. Uh, and the sort of getting over yourself of the of the uh, deep expertise and learning to work productively with other people who have different areas of deep expertise yeah. is a bit of a is a bit of a curve that they they typically say is like uh, people have to learn to both speak and listen in a way that other people can understand and in a way that becomes a productive collaboration. And certainly in my experience, that's that's been true of working with um, working with medical doctors, working with people in in other fields is especially somehow especially it's a physicist thing maybe it's an ego thing um where they tend to walk in they're like because ours is quite a fundamental science we just think as a physicist that we can walk in the room and be like oh I could solve your problem in in no in no time you know I could create a model that will prove that and you can't because you you'll create a very basic model and the reality is much more complex but there is a bit of a physicist ego problem I find where people have to to get over that but when they do and they do it successfully, that's where some really interesting research is happening on, you know, the borders of like neurobiology and things like that. Yeah. yeah. OK, so kind of going off of that, if um, if we have people in the audience today who are maybe not so sure about reading a physics book, maybe they don't live their daily life in the sciences. Um, what would you say to um, encourage them to pick up the matter of everything? Right. So, um, yeah, the, the, the main thing is like, it's a lot less about like big physics, uh, topics than, than most physics books you'd, you'd pick up, but also the, the main thing I've tried to do with this book is, is that sort of, so what, like we make these big discoveries, we investigate this fundamental stuff. So what, what happens then? And it's a part of the story that's often left out, but it's an incredibly important one because everything from, yep, yeah, x-rays, cancer treatment technology through to the World Wide web, um, emerged, uh, through this kind of research. So actually it's had an enormous impact on our society and what I've tried to tell, and it's a very like, it's a story driven book. So even if you don't understand every concept in the physics, don't worry about it, just keep going because it's it's stories of people and how these, these different aspects of 
research, innovation, et cetera, coalesce in order to sort of produce our modern world. And these stories of innovation and technology especially are usually um, told separately from the stories of fundamental discovery and science and curiosity. Uh, and what's different about this book is that I've weaved the two together. So, for example, you might not know that the first um, the first IPO, the first public offered company in Silicon Valley, sells particle accelerators. <laughs> That's what they sell. They're called Varian, um, and they they were you know one of the founding companies in that area before like before the sort of Silicon Revolution. But I explain in the book one of the reasons why. Um, why that revolution happened in the Silicon Valley area is because this industry around radar and particle accelerators created a high-tech um, base in the area from which it, it was then sort of obvious that they had the skills to move to that next technology of the silicon-based technology um, and that sort of concentration of highly skilled people and highly skilled craftspeople as well and, and industrial suppliers sort of is, is where the history of that area emerges from, which I learned through writing the book. I didn't know that before. So that was that was amazing to me as well. So I think there's sort of something for everyone in there, depending on what you're interested in, whether it's stories of people and his, you know, the historical challenges they faced, especially as women, or whether you're, you know, you're more into tech stuff and like, oh, I had no idea that that was connected. Um, yeah, there's sort of something, I, I, I hope that there's something for everyone in there. Yeah. Absolutely. I I think I would agree. I've gotten to read um, parts of the book and it's definitely physics for everyone. I mean, <laughs> I hope um, so. <laughs> yeah. um, you've done a great job. Um, so I'm a little curious about your writing process. Um, mm. And so if you want to talk a little bit about your writing process and then maybe talk a little bit about how long did it take you to take this book from um, when you were making presentations and had an agent approach you to today when the book is out in the world? Yeah, so a couple of years, basically, the the whole um, writing up to the point where it was sort of handed over for final, final edit and proofreading was about 18 months. Um, that happened through the pandemic. So that was um, interesting because I think I started out with this writing process of like, oh, I'll go and visit these labs because it's much easier to have a narrative driven story visualizing the space and the people if you've actually been there um and then you know my my travel plans got curbed <laughs> like everybody's did um in in 2020 uh so I, I did get to do some travel before that though in the early research phase which was great so so I sort of constructing the book was me writing this enormous list of tw of experiments in the history of and and I take the particle physics line so you know um, from the first subatomic particle through to the Higgs boson and through to things like questions around dark matter. So, and then I chunked that up into like, okay, what do I think were the most important experiments and also the ones that contributed in some way to our technology, although there's one exception, but when you read the book, you'll, you'll find it. Um, <laughs> uh, and it just fell out as like 12 different experiments um, that I thought were, were the key. And then I sort of delved into what I, you know, the sort of surface level of the stories uh, in writing the book proposal and then when I wrote the book proper oh then you delve in and you go oh my goodness it's a like every experiment every person has multiple books and multiple stories written about them so the depth of information out there was overwhelming so at some point I had to almost set aside what other people had written about it and I went straight to the original sources I went straight to the the academic papers that the people had written and the biographies and autobiographies of the people who had done the work and then obviously visited as many places as I could as well. So that's how the research process happened for me. At some point, you have to cut yourself off as a writer in the research process and just write. Um, but that uncovered a lot of new things that I think I wouldn't have got if I just used other people's sources, yeah. which was really, I really enjoyed that process. Reading the original papers in the writing of the people who did it, you know, a hundred and something years ago, these are the big names in my field. And yet, and yet I'd never read their original papers. So that was, that was lovely. Um, process wise, uh, yeah, I had to find my sweet spot of how I write best. Um, and I ended up joining this beautiful writers community called the London, London Writers Salon. Um, 
And they started up during the pandemic to create a virtual writing space for people one hour at a time. It's like a one hour writing sprint. Um, and you're online with like 300 other people who are all writing their own project at the same time in silence. It's like a little intro, a little outro. Um, and it keeps you accountable. And there's four of them on different time zones throughout the day. So most people only do one. Eventually I got to using those four hours a day as my like four hours where I was not allowed to do anything but write. I wasn't allowed to research anymore. I wasn't allowed to go and look at anything. I just had to produce words. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, and that uh, not only you know helped structure my writing to get the book written, um, but also was a lovely way to meet so many other other writers and get feedback in those early phases. Um, and I think one of the things that really influenced me is that a lot of my writing community, because I'm part of a, a in-person writing community in Oxford as well, a lot of the other writers are fiction writers or even you know science fiction, things like that. Um, not many writers in those communities are, are non-fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I found it really valuable to get the feedback from fiction writers because I was writing a more narrative-driven style mm -hmm. Um, and learn from them all, all the tips and tricks and ways of enlivening a story and getting the story structure right and, and all these things. So I, I, you know, I sort of approached it as I would an experiment, really. I was like, right, I don't know how to get from start to finish. So I'm going to ask people, I'm going to, you know, find resources, I'm going to ask for feedback, I'm going to, you know, and that, um, yeah, no one really talks about a book as a, as a, valuable learning process but for me it really was like I learned so much about story and about writing and about narrative um and and I yeah I, so I loved it so I was there yeah I'd sort of delve in and out and do my like structured hours per day and then when I was um because I was stuck out the lab right like my lab closed during COVID which is probably the only reason I got the book written to be honest <laughs> That's why experimentalists don't write books. Is we're always <laughs> we're always stuck in the lab. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, but it, it gave me that structure, and I've kept some of that structure now. So the first writing, the first writing session of the day, which is usually like eight to nine a.m. on yeah. either UK time or Australian time, they, and they're also um, Eastern West US time as well. There's like an eight to nine hour. Um, so I'm you'll often find me in one of those. Uh, I, I kept using that process. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to throw it to our audience again. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, if you don't have any questions, I'll keep asking them, but would love to hear from those who are listening today. Um, while I wait for maybe some questions to get dropped in, um, you mentioned kind of briefly to me before we jumped on this call that um, there's a another theme throughout the book of hope. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit? Yeah, I um, it, this emerged after I'd written the book and in conversation with other people who'd read it. Um, so the sort of big picture trajectory of the book through these experiments is we start with these sort of small lab scale experiments. And then the questions that we're asking get too difficult for sort of one small group of researchers to, to do. So people have to band together and join, either create big labs, which is in the US post-World War II, there were a, a bunch of big labs created like um, Fermilab, like um, uh, like Berkeley expanded as well um, and Brookhaven and some others that you might have heard of um, to do these like large scale experiments which are usually um, based on particle accelerators in, in the story or, or, or big detectors and so as, as I sort of mentioned before these physicists suddenly had to learn to collaborate and collaborate in on a scale that no one had really done before in the sciences and then what comes out of that especially once you get these multidisciplinary labs and these, you know, you put lots of smart people together to solve a difficult problem. Um, you get all these like emerging ideas and technologies and inventions. And, um, you know, that's, that's how, for example, Tim Berners-Lee decided he needed to solve the data problem of, of the experiments at CERN. And so he created all the protocols behind and created the World Wide Web. Um, but for example, at Fermilab in the US, um, when they were building 
this new machine, which was meant to be a superconducting machine, they had to invent the process of making the wire for superconducting magnets because it, um, and, and just making superconducting magnets at all, which had never been done before. And they needed to do it on like industrial scale. And so they worked away at it, they found the recipe and then they gave that recipe out for free to all the companies who then made the wire and then competed um, with the tender back to, you know, to make this like kilometer radius um, machine, which was the Fermi, the Tevatron at Fermilab. Um, and it was the first sort of successful big superconducting collider that had been built. And they were walking in there and asking for as much superconducting wire as had ever been made in the world before, you know, like they're, they're like buying the world's supply of this stuff, right? Um, and nowadays people look back on that and go, oh, if we'd, um, if, if they hadn't have pushed for technology in that way and like just being dogged about doing it, we wouldn't have things like MRI scanners today because that industrialization process enabled that to happen. Um, you know, from yeah, sort of levitating and fast trains that use superconductors to MRI to every, everything in between. And so we find this story where um, these collaborations and this new way of working, sometimes on these big experiments and in big labs, has sort of enabled things to be discovered and invented that, that weren't before. Um, and by the time you get to today, you get to these massive international collaborations and that's where the hope starts to creep in because these big projects have gone from a national, like from a nation building type of idea to an international collabor collaboration science for peace type model, which is actually in the remit of CERN, the big European particle physics lab of which the US is also a, a member. Um, and, and it's at, its remit is science for peace. It isn't allowed to work on anything for defense or national security or anything like that. Um, and, and so what you get there is people whose countries have traditional traditionally been at war or whose countries are currently at war working alongside each other towards something that is greater than the sort of political concerns of the individual countries. And that in itself is a really powerful idea to the point where CERN actually teach the UN how to collaborate internationally um, and mm. and you know things come out of that that you wouldn't expect whether that's cultural exchanges whether that's yeah learnings for for other international collaborations um, and so I think as, when you look at that whole big picture you're like wow like people coming together to solve a really difficult problem in a fundamental area has led to so many unexpected things that we would never have predicted. Not just, I mean, they have solved the problems and they've built all this knowledge and that's amazing and valuable and, and you know, philosophically wonderful. But we've also created all these other things from techno like life-saving technologies to learning how people can actually sort of bridge um, divides, political divides um, using uh, using something like science. Uh, so, so that that flow of ideas through the book, I think, led a lot of people to reflect back to me that they felt incredibly hopeful as a result of the story, because it just shows that even the big challenges we're facing today, this ability that we now have to come together across borders, across cultures, um, to solve big problems together, is really where our power lies as people. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully if you read it, you will feel the same. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Um, all right, as you think to the future, what's next for you? Or what are you currently working on, maybe? Yes, so um, so what comes next in the book is kind of the next big experiments. Um, and I don't personally work on those big colliders, so I'm a bit objective about like what's going to be built next. Um, it's a very hot topic at the moment that a lot of people have opinions on as to whether we should build these massive next generation colliders or experiments. Um, but there's, I try to highlight like that there's lots of things happening at the same time because we we sort of are at a point in the history of particle physics especially whereby we we don't know what's going to be found next it's not like we have a thing that we're out looking for uh like we had with the Higgs boson which was the sort of final piece of the standard model of particle physics that was found in in, in the book um we don't know what that next thing is. And so diversity of experiments is currently a really important thing for us to have. And yet the scale of some of them that we would need to make big, we think to make big progress is so large, it, it can be like a $20 billion project. Um, and so there's, yeah, all kinds of interesting politics and all kind, you know, politics yeah. versus physics versus, um, and even the timescales are, are, are really hard to manage 
now, right? Like one of one of the concerns in the field is that some of these big collider projects um, may not even be realized within my career lifetime. Uh, so I'm asking graduate students to come and join the field to exploit a, a, an experiment that they might only get to use if they reach full professor level. And it's like, well, how are they going to reach full professor if they have no experimental data? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so there's some interesting dynamics happening. And I'm sure in another 50 years, someone will write a similar book, which explores how we overcame those dynamics. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so now we're asking these big questions about um, little gaps that we find in, in, in the theories um, and asking questions about things like dark matter and dark energy and the other parts of the universe that are not the, the sort of matter particles and force force some um, force particles that we already know of um because we know that there's something beyond what our current theories explain and the wonderful thing about the experiments that are currently happening and hopefully results that might start coming through in, in future years is that they're they're ruling out theories at a rate that we haven't seen for a long time um and so that's sending the theoretical physicists back to the drawing board around okay let's come up with new ideas about how the universe works um personally i've always been like i'm i'm i love that big picture stuff and i will of course contribute when you know the decision is made of of what the next big machine is but i also love the fact that you can use these technologies that are created for these big collider projects and actually make a difference in the real world with them. So my new lab here in Melbourne, which has just been renovated. And I, I talk about the, the unrenovated book in the uh, lab in the end of the book. And now I can say it has been renovated. It now looks beautiful as was described in my vision in the book, which is very exciting. Um, and in that lab, we're developing um, compact technology for cancer treatment. So trying to improve cancer treatment, which already uses particle accelerators by improving the technology that that delivers the beams in the first place that's wonderful um i am making an assumption here but i think you are a reader um what are you currently reading oh um actually the one i'm currently part way through had it on as an audio book because i was actually traveling across australia just just like until a couple of days ago um driving across was um oh what's it called is what it sounds like I think it's called it's the a new book about um sound and music and how um how and why it is that we like the music that we like uh and that's and, and it's got like they refer to songs like there's like a little playlist that goes with it so that you so I've been listening to all sorts of um music that challenges me in different ways and trying to figure out like oh okay why why is that um so that one's really fun at the yeah. moment that's awesome. Um, if our audience wants to stay in touch with you, um, where can they find you? Um, social sure. media? Right? Yeah, Twitter and Instagram are my main two go to. So at Susie Shee on, on Twitter and at Dr. Susie Shee on uh, Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I think I'm going to wrap us up here. Um, we are recording this session. So if you have any interest in rewatching this conversation, you will be able to find that on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. If you haven't yet ordered a copy of the book, we encourage you to do that. I've dropped the links in our um, chat here. There's the cover of the book. It's a what it looks like if you see it. <laughs> Um, maybe you just want to buy it to put it on your shelf and um, stare at the pretty cover. That would be okay too. <laughs> Um, Susie, thank you so much. This was a lovely conversation. I feel like I've learned so much. I um, am happy to have this book on my shelf and I'm excited to learn more um, as I continue reading. Thanks, Elizabeth. And thanks everyone for coming along or for watching online. Have a wonderful evening.